So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Mastering C2DM or the Android Cloud Device Messaging Framework. Uh, my name is Alexander Gargenta. I work for a company called Mercana um, here in San Francisco. Well, here, I guess close enough. As I said, if you'd like to access the slides, including the example code that I'll be showing you later on, it's available at that URL. You can also scan the QR code if you'd like. Um, so let me just see how this works. I've never actually used Google Docs for presentations, so how do you actually advance to the next slide is interesting. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, just a few words about myself. Um, I've been doing Java since 96, Android, I guess, for the last two years. I, um, so Marcana, the company I work for, is, uh, in fact, focuses on training uh, specific open source software, so I do I teach, among other things, Android and Java. I um, happen to uh, run the Java user group in San Francisco as well as the Android user group. Um, and I'm a co-founder and co-organizer of the HTML5 user group. So all, all here in San Francisco. Uh, we do a lot of events. Uh, if any of you are interested in learning more about these things, I highly recommend you check out some of the videos we have posted from our events, from all these user groups on maracana.com slash tech TV. Uh, in the past life, I worked on things like SMS, uh, WAP, push, MMS, things that involve push technologies, if you will. Um, so as far as the outline, so what the goal is for today, although to be honest, this is my first time teaching or, or, or demoing this particular or going over this particular talk. So hopefully we'll get to everything. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, but the outline for today is to uh, discuss push versus pull or pull versus push. Uh, discuss C2DM, what it is, um, even talk about some of the other you know, non-C2DM options you may have, uh, go over the requirements, limitations, uh, get a sense of what the big picture is, um, you know, figure out how it works, um, talk about the implementations, so both from you know, signing up for an account, uh, you know, subscribing to for, or for registering your app for C2DM, um, you know, your, your talk about the app server and things you need to do on the app server, uh, the you know additional features of C2DM um, such as collapse keys, uh, the an annotation, um, and then summarize everything and uh, give you hopefully guys some time to ask questions. Okay. As far as the assumptions I make of, of you know of you the or, you know the audience is I hope you all know Java. I hope you have some experience building Android apps. It certainly helps if you know what broadcast receivers are, what ANRs are, how to avoid them, why you need to avoid them. What services are? If you've worked in, used the intent services, that much better. Um, if you know what permissions, at least to get a sense for what the security model is on Android. Uh, wake clocks, nah. If you haven't used them, don't worry. We'll explain them. And um, you know, if you have some basic understanding of HTTP, so you know, when I say you know, post this HTTP with some parameters and, and request headers, hopefully you know what that means. If you don't, it's not that hard to figure out. There are libraries that will do it for you. Um, the back the back end of uh, of the demo application, which I hope will be able to get working, is actually built in PHP. Not my first choice, but just because of the you know in framework that we were using on the server side, it just tended to be what I used. Um, so if you know a little bit of PHP, it helps. If you don't, don't worry. It's all conceptual after, uh, anyways. So um, as far as the kind of just some of the acknowledgments, um, a lot of the a lot of what I'm going to say has been said before. Okay, so hopefully, you know, we'll dig a little deeper, but there are really good resources in C2DM, uh, specifically from Google. They did a talk on it last, at the last Google I.O., so in the video of it is available online. Slides there are available online, and then there's a C2DM uh, page, a code at google.com slash android slash C2DM, that has really good resources. Okay, um, they give you kind of the steps you need to go through, so that's, you know, that's where I effectively learned everything from. Uh, but, you know, the difference is if you've seen these things, if you've go, go, gone through these things, that in this talk, hopefully we'll be able to dig a little deeper. Okay, and actually go and walk through the code. So, that said, um, why do we care about this? What, you know, what's the big why behind C2DM? And again, some of this information comes directly from actually uh, the, the, the video from last Google, uh, from, from C2DM talk at uh, Google I.O. So, basically the requirement is, hopefully, is to build apps that allow, you know, the data on the apps to be kept fresh, right? So basically, we want to, um, you know, keep apps synced with the cloud, um, yet we don't want to drain the user's battery. Now, normally, how we tended to do things, um, especially because you know, Android support, supports background services, 
is we would you know build some kind of a background services and potentially do you know polling. Um, that's okay when content changes very frequently, um, and when we're okay to have somewhat stale data. Meaning you know if we if we don't full poll frequently enough and data changes in the server, we don't yet sync it. We're tolerant of that, but um, you know or actually before we get to the but. Um, you know, one of the things we should try to do if we do have to do this is to do the check for freshness on the server side. So the client, meaning our Android application, assuming we're, you know, syncing with the cloud through HTTP, which tends to be what most people use these days, is we should submit, for example, uh, you know, a request with if modified since. We put, you know, the last timestamp of what, the, you know, last, last time we fetched the data. And the server decides on, you know, whether the data is new or not and gives us only the new data. Um, as opposed to us needlessly downloading data, you know, and then throwing away stuff that we've already seen before. So we want to minimize the, the amount of work we have to do in a poll if we decide to do polling in the first place. Um, that said, we want to poll as, as, as infrequently as possible. Of course, that, you know, the frequency of polling affects the freshness of the data. Um, the reason why is, and again, this, these numbers come right from, from that presentation, is, you know, when your device is idle, um, the, your baseband modem is connected to the network, um, but, you know, it's drawing something like 5 to 8 milliamps. Um, in a poll, even in a short poll, which, by the way, even if you do a very, very short poll, the radio stays on for a few more seconds, you'd be looking at, you know, 115 for reading and about 200 milliamps for transmitting data, okay, depending on what you need to do. Um, so basically, it works out to roughly about, you know, 0 0.5 milliamp hours, you know, if you do it every five minutes, you can kind of see that it's around 144 milliamp hours, for example, in a day. And you could imagine that that's, you know, roughly 10% of your battery for just one application. If you obviously increase the or decrease the frequency, so you do it like every 15 minutes, that obviously changes. But still, you know, it, the more applications users run on their phones, and a lot of applications want to keep things fresh, the, you know, the harder it is to, or the more strain we put on the battery. Okay? So... Since poll, polling sucks in general, uh, what can we do instead? So push is obviously, you know, the, the, the logical answer. And, you know, the idea with push is we get the, uh, the freshness of our data, but, um, you know, we don't put a strain on the battery. Or at least, you know, the, the, the battery and network utilization corresponds to, you know, how, how basically uh, frequently our data changes rather than how frequently we pull for data changes. Although that even can, you know, be affected with C2DM as we'll explain later. So one, you know, one, options for, one of the options for, for doing a simple uh, push is to do it via, you know, SMS. You could basically, you know, get an account with something like Clickatel or one of those SMS providers. You send an SMS, you know, from your server to the app. The app intercepts the SMS, interprets it as, as a notification of some, some interesting event, and then goes to your server to fetch data, okay? We could do WAP push, although, to be honest, I've never actually used WAP push on, on an Android device. I've used it before, hated it. But um, we'll explain, uh, you know, how it differs. But it's basically just SMS, okay? It's uh, still based on SMS. Um, another option we, we have is to get a, you know, build a persistent connection with their server. When I say persistent, that sounds like it's expensive, but in reality, since it's in packet switched, if you're not using the connection, the radio can actually, you know, go into the somewhat idle mode, so it's not really drawing the power. Um, and Android allows this fairly easily by, you know, effectively allowing us to build a background service that creates a connection to our server and then needs to react to all these network changes. And because of the fact that networks tend to be flaky, and especially as you switch from different modes, right, um, this background service would need to, you know, effectively have the logic to recover from drop connections, uh, to, to, to detect these half-open connections. Because, you know, in between us and our server, there are all these potential, you know, whether they're firewalls, NAT, NAT switches, um, or whatever, network gear that just doesn't like effectively persistent, uh, uh, persistent connections. It tends to close them, right? So generally what that would involve is us having some kind of, you know, periodic checks to ensure that the connections are okay. So that usually is done with pings, right? So pings and X, uh, which kind of looks like polling, but, you know, there's not much you can do about it, Ex you know, we, we, but it still gives you that per persistent connection. And then when the server wants to inform you of some event, they just use that connection with your device, they drop a message, you get it, and you react to it. 
So this is doable, but it's not trivial, okay? And what sucks about it is, as you will see in a moment, is if every application were to do this, there will be a lot of overhead, right? Versus using a single framework that everyone can, you know, uh, take advantage of. Um, and then the last option, which is hopefully why you guys are here, is the C2DM, which is basically, you know, it is persistent connection, uh, but since, you know, effectively Google manages everything for us, it's already being used by Google for the Google apps that we most of us have on the, on the, on the devices. Um, and it's super easy and it's free, okay? So it feels like a no-brainer. Now, we'll see kind of the, the differences between these approaches. So just, just for the sake of, you know, uh, I guess completeness, if you were to go and do an SMS-based notification, you could build some kind of a application that has a, a broadcast receiver which reacts to the SMS received message. For that, you need the receive SMS permission. And one of the other things I did here is I make my SMS receiver, I change the priority of it, okay? The reason why I change the priority of it is because the SMS received notifications, broadcast notifications, are actually sent as an ordered uh, broadcast, which means that they're always sent in a predetermined sequence of the priority of the different receivers interested in this, okay? So if I were to build the Java, you know, the Java side of it, is I, would, I could build it in, in this way. So it would basically be some kind of a receiver that would on receive off my SMS receive notification, go through or grab this, you know, pods or, you know, PDUs effectively extra, interpret it as a byte array, parse it into an SMS message, decide whether this SMS message is, you know, the, whether it means it's a notification, how we can decide it, we can say, for example, is it from a particular number? Or does the body of the SMS equal some pre predetermined string or whatever, right? And then if it is, we could basically process that notification, whatever that means for us, and then we can simply call a board broadcast, which means that nobody else would get that SMS message. And if we were the first ones to run, you know, then we are the only ones to consume that SMS message. And, you know, it's not like it's going to show up in your, you know, SMS, you know, message queue or whatever, okay? But this still costs money, so it's not ideal, okay? A web push is a more structured way to do notifications, but it involves a huge amount of, well, first of all, it requires you understand web push. You know, there's like, they have a special, um, you know, format of the message you need to use. But effectively, with web push, it's a binary SMS with a URL embedded in it, which, uh, you know, tells your application or, you know, that it should go and fetch the data from some location, okay? Effectively, that's, that's what we want to have, right? Ideally, the notification is just to tickle our application to get it to do something, okay? This, I get I'm going to just copy paste and stole it from Wikipedia, but um, needless to say, the whole point is that this is complicated. Now, that's not to say once we see the C to the M diagram, things are going to be super simple, but at least once you understand that most of it is taken care of for us, you'll really only focus on only one part of that diagram that we'll see later. But there's too much, too much, over, uh, too much work here, and it still costs us money. Um, so if we were to roll our own connection, um, or our, our own persistent connection, as I mentioned, we could build a background service. We could use an alarm manager on Android to periodically wake us up. Well, we, you know, we could then check on this, the health of the connection. We could grab a wake clock in order to reconnect because that may be a longer, you know, longer operation. We would need to handle, um, you know, things like network changes or the user deciding not to support background data or user roaming, all these different things that can happen on the device. And we still have to decide how often do we check for the health of this connection, which is, you know, again, that involves polling, and polling, as we know, drains battery. So we want to do it as frequently as possible. But if we if we do it super infrequently, to you know, to maximize the battery, we basically risk not detecting when the connection is dead and missing some push notifications, right? Um, and because presumably all of our users, which we hope we have millions of, would have these persistent connections to our servers. And as you as you know, there's a limit as to how many connections you know machines tend to like to you know tend to accept. That it means that we now need to figure out how to scale our you know backend infrastructure to support all these connections. Okay, so it just means again more work for us. Um, and what if there are multiple applications on these devices, right? 
are you know, what if every single one of them were to roll their own? Are they all going to go and do a background service? Are they all going to wake up the radio to test for the health of the connection? How is that going to affect their battery? We can be very well back to square one, you know, which is kind of what we would happen with multiple applications of doing their own polling, right? So this, while possible, it's not, you know, it's not recommended just because it involves more, a lot of work and a lot of overhead and it puts a strain on your server side. So, see to the end. Hopefully this is why you guys are here. So basically the idea is Google already has a persistent connection. It's a TCP, it's an SSL encrypted TCP IP connection between your phone and the Google servers at all times and it's already there. Okay? Why is it already there? All of the Google apps already use it. So market, Gmail, calendar, contacts, voice. All of this, you know, all of, for example, you get an SMS or you get a, you know, uh, a, a message or let's say a, G, you know, a new Gmail, uh, you know, email comes in, you get notified through, through that push. Um, you want to, for example, go to market.android.com, you select an app you want to install, you say push to my phone. How does the push work? Through that persistent connection. Voice, you get, an, you know, a voice message that's pushed through the connection. Effectively, everything goes over that one single connection and it's already there. Okay? So effectively, you know, what C2DM is, is what we just discussed before of having that persistent connection, but we are not doing any, any of the work, Google is doing it for us, or actually letting us use what they've already built. Okay? So there is some polling involved, I'm just, I'll get to you, um, but that polling basically you know, is being done by Google anyways, we're already paying the penalty of it, if you will, and as you will see later, it's not actually that big of a penalty. So why not take advantage of it? So please go ahead. So that's a good point, and we'll come back to that. That's going to come in the next the next couple of slides on you know the limit the requirements and limitations. But you're right, okay? Which is not that big of a deal in most cases, but nevertheless is it is a potential limitation, okay? So how do, you know? So exactly you know what is then C to D N? Um, effectively, the way I see it, it's a lightweight messaging framework plus a service that provides that push functionality off. So, so basically we can, we, what it gives us is ability to push our messages from our servers via Google servers to our apps running on our users' devices. Okay, that's what it is. Um, it's way more efficient because we basically piggyback on what's already there. And, you know, Google takes care of all of the hard work, the message queuing, for example, if our device is not online and being able to deliver the message later on. Um, you know, doing the best effort delivery, so, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll keep the message for, you know, fairly long time, retry, and so on and so on. And they already do the hard work of verifying that the connection between us and Google or our devices and Google is already there. Um, but one thing you need to realize is that the idea, the intent of the C2DM is not to deliver content to your devices, but rather to wake up your device, inform it of some event, and have your device fetch content. Because of the fact that you know, your, your, your messages may be delivered out of order, and that it's best effort but not guaranteed delivery, you generally don't want to have any state in the message. You generally don't want to have too much data in the message. You're already real limited, actually, in how much data you can have, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You generally want to use these push messages, as you will see, just to tickle your application, have your application wake up, and then do something in response to that, okay? So, what are the requirements and the limitations? So, first and foremost, you need Froyo, or, you know, Android API 8, 2.2 or better, uh, which, you know, sucks for some of you that are still on, to, you know, Eclair. Um, you do need a market app on the device, okay? Now, the, your apps don't have to be installed through market. They can be side-loaded. Okay? They don't have to actually come from market, but there needs to be market, and it has to be provisioned with at least one Google account. Okay? Now, you, before you say, well, that sucks, which you know, is a fair point, it's okay because majority, and I don't know the statistic, but majority of our users do use market and do have accounts provisioned with Google. Okay? Well, they may not use it as the primary account, but they use it as a way of installing apps. Yes, there's some that don't, and yes, you may not be able to target your entire user population, but then again, are those users the ones you want to target in the first place? Um, but that's just a side note. On the emulator, in order to test this, you, you know, to actually test C2DM, you need to build a 
uh, an emulator based on the Google API's 8 image. So you, you do not, the, and the vanilla Android image will not do, okay? And you need to provision at least one Google account, okay? Again, you don't have, you're, you're, you're actually not going to have market on the emulator, but you'll have the services that are basically provided that includes E2DM as well as that account, which is actually going to be able to, how, how Google manages that connection, okay? Now, as far as the limitations, so again, best effort delivery. So our, you know, our messages can get lost, our messages can be delivered out of order. So for example, if you were building a chat application, as Google says on their website, you want to deliver the actual chat message via the push because they may deli be delivered out of order or they may not be delivered at all. So you do is you tickle the application, have the application go to your server and fetch the latest chat history, as an example. Okay? Just because of how this, you know, what, what promises they effectively offer as part of C2DM. The payload of our data that we embed in the message that we push through C2DM that makes it on their device is 1024 bytes. So not that we ever expect you to be putting, or not we, Google expects you to be putting that much data into the uh, message in the first place. There's no support currently for TTLs. You can't say oh, I want my message to auto-expire in two minutes if the device isn't online. Uh, Google tends to keep the message or try the, me the message delivery for weeks to up to a month. They, they, don't, they haven't necessarily stated what the number is, but it's an order of weeks before they probably just discard it, okay? But chances are, you know, at that point, you know, maybe it's no longer relevant anyways. Um, the biggest, I would say, limitation that I see is the fact that this is still in labs. So it's still a Google Labs project. They said that they were going to release it to, for you know, general use at the end of last year. Hasn't yet happened. I reached out to Google, asked them when it's going to happen. Still haven't heard back. So it's, it's kind of effectively the reason why this sucks is for two, for two reasons. One is you first need to apply for a, for a C2DM account. So you need to be approved. They tend to approve most people. I don't know exactly what their approval process looks like. They haven't, you know, been very upfront about it. But it, it's not that hard to get approved, okay? Then what you need to do, or the other issue is that the quota, quota limits are not quite clear yet, right? So what they do is they impose quota limits on how many, uh, you know, messages you can send in aggregate and also how many messages you can send to one particular app on a particular device at a given, a given time, okay? Go ahead. Uh, do we need to be approved even for a test account? Yes, you need to be, you need to, effectively the way it works is you get, you sign up and you will talk about that process, you get a developer account, and then when you're ready to actually go prime time, you, you contact them and you tell them, hey, this is what I build, this is what I expect, can you, you know, effectively ask them politely to give you, you know, the, the, the quarter limits you expect you're going to need. Okay, and so it's a somewhat informal, somewhat, you know, un undocumented, if you will. So there's a, you know, a somewhat of a risk as to whether or not you'll be approved. You may need to talk to them ahead of time before you go and invest heavily in this. Go ahead. That's a good, very, that's a good point. So, well, but it has to do with also how you build step four, which we'll get to. Because if you cache your auth token long enough, so you don't have to fre that frequently go and grab it, then you may not be prompted for oh, captures yeah. challenge. It has to do with whether they expect there are too many logins, whether they see too many logins. Yeah. So let's take a look at the big picture, okay? So yes, it's quite, quite, you know, quite a few steps involved. There's 10 of them, and in fact, there, some of them have you know, kind of inner steps, if you will. Uh, but most of these steps you only have to go through once, okay? And the rest, you know, most of the other steps, you know, tend to happen at least, you know, almost half of them tend to happen by Google. So they're out of our hands anyways. So the way it works, and we'll go through these things in, and actually look at the code in detail. The way it works is you first, the step number zero is basically us getting a, um, a registering for an account, signing up for a C2DM account so we get whitelisted. Okay, so assuming we have that, and we, when we do that, we, as you will see, you provide some kind of an email address. Okay, they call it the sender email address. Okay, what you then do is you build an application which uses C2DM. The, the, that application, when it gets installed on the device, and the user, for example, selects, you know, a checkbox that says, I want to keep my application up to date or in sync or whatever, you, however you build it, the application will go and register for C2DM. It does so by invoking an internal local service, and to it, it passes this sender account, this special account that Google approved on for you, 
Okay? What you then do is you send that out uh, to Google. That somehow communicates with the Google C2DM servers. What you get back is some kind of a registration ID. That registration ID is unique for that particular app on that particular device. Right? So you may have millions of installations of your app, and every installation is going to have a separate registration ID. Okay? What you then do is you send the registration ID. So step number two is you send the registration ID to your server from where you'll be doing the push. Okay? So I'm assuming you guys understand that you know, push involves having some kind of a server component. Otherwise, what the heck are we pushing here, right? <laughs> so we push it to our server. When our server goes, grabs the registration ID and records it on the server side. Now, we can record a registration ID for the user, right? Uh, if we have a concept of a user on the device, or we can record that registration ID for that particular device, okay? If we know of that particular device, so that we can target that particular device or that particular user in the future. What we then do when it comes time to actually send a message to our to our app is we go and talk to something called Google Client Login Service. It's something, it's basically a Google authentication mechanism that is not tied to C2DM. It's used by other services that basically, you know, that Google has. And the way it works is you send a, as you will see, an HTTP post message uh, to this, C2, uh, this client login service and in it you include the type of the service you're trying to authenticate for, which is the C2DM. The, the username, which is or email, which is basically the email that was used when registering for the account here, and your password. And what you get back, if the authentication is valid, you get back some kind of an auth token. Now, you're supposed to remember that auth token on the server side. You're not supposed to constantly go and re-authenticate, because if you do, then Google, this client login service, as you pointed out, Frank, it can basically go and ask you to, uh, can prompt you one of those, whatever, capture challenges, right? And so then, you know, how, how the heck do you do it? Because this is all supposed to be automated. You can't really do capture on a server, which there's no human to actually prove that, you know, it's you. Um, because this role account that we use, it's not really meant to be tied to a human anyways. It's basically one of these, just, you know, a role account. It's basically an app account. Go ahead. How do you get the challenge? How do you get around it? You can't really because, you know, unless you, you know, you have connection with those spammers that know how to get around it. What we did is uh, we had it send an email to like a public mailbox with like 30 people on it. And then someone has to jump in and log in quickly. And right, that. but... Oh, Right, or you hire an army, That's like, you know, yeah. you hire an army of offshore, uh, you know, CAPTCHA <laughs> solvers. CAPTCHA <laughs> Exactly. Um, no, generally, the reason why you ha get it is because the client login service... Uh, you know, effectively checks on the on the frequency of your logins. So you're supposed to cache the token and not and use it as long as you can, as long as the C to the end, as long as the next step doesn't fail. If only the next step fails with a 401, as you will see, then you go back and reauthenticate. That way, you will most likely not get prompted. Yeah. Now, now that we have that token from Google, we now go to to effectively push our message. As you will see, our message is going to be a simple HTTP post. That post is going to include the registration ID, which allows us to target a particular device, our app on a particular device, as well as the data that we want to put in, as well as this, this auth token, which we got from the client service. Now, this auth token is tied to a particular account that was used to register or, an, or create the registration ID in the first place. So if the two don't match, that's going to fail. Okay, so the C2DM front end, once it gets our post, okay, it goes and verifies, you know, that we are, you know, authentic. So it verifies our your token. It then goes and effectively does two things. It queues our message into some kind of a message queue, so that if, if you know the next steps were to fail, the message would be would be persistent, right? So it tries to you know for recovery purposes, and it then tries to find the actual C to D M messaging excuse me messaging server which is tied to our particular application, okay, or our particular device I should say because the messaging the connection is not for just our application it's for all applications on the device. And so it routes the message to that server. Now, that server goes through a logic of deciding whether the message should be sent right away or whether it should be delayed. They will see, you know, see how that works later. But at some point, 
hopefully right away, it goes and grabs that message and pushes it over that persistent connection to our application. Our application now gets tickled, you know, gets tickled through effectively a broadcast message. We then wake up. If we do something that's not trivial, we generally go and grab a wake clock. We start some kind of a, you know, intense service. We'll talk about that and we'll show some code. And then we go and do the work, right? So we do, for example, generally, generally, and one of the things that's, you know, missing here is we generally go and go back to our server to fetch the data that we're so interested in, okay? Assuming that this is just to inform us that something changed. Um, upon successful receipt of the message by the device, there's an act that goes back over the same connection to the Google server. The Google messaging server then, you know, now it knows the message was delivered, it removes it from the queue. In case this connection is severed, like for whatever reason, you know, if this doesn't work, then basically the message stays in the queue and, you know, it retries again later. So we'll, we'll see how that works. Now, we're going to go through these steps one by one. Are there any specific questions with this? So how do you know whether this is working, right? Yeah. So, so the question, I mean, I guess another way to look at it, is there an end-to-end, -end, you know, act? And the way it works is really the way you build your, it's, you build it into the logic of your application. So the idea is your, your server pushes the message. And that message somehow, hopefully, makes its way to your app. If, if your app gets it, which involves potentially refreshing the data, your app can go back to your server to fetch the data. At that point, if you include some kind of a token that's unique to that particular notification, your server knows that the message was received. And if it wasn't, it can retry automatically later, as an example. So that would be like, you know, your end-to-end, -end, you know, verification the message was received. I don't know if that answers your question. So... Um, the, we're going to go into the details of these particular steps, but just as a big picture, are there any questions now? So step one and step four, you mentioned just the part there, so why are the same email address? Is this, does this have to be the same email address? Yes, this has to be exactly the same email address as the one you use when you sign up for an account. So the step zero is sign up for an account and you, and you provide an email address at that point. So my reg ID is tied to the email address and also the auth token is tied to the same email address. That's right. If they don't match up, then step six will fail. That's correct. Okay. And you, for example, the app that, that you know, I'm going to demo, you know, what we do is we make that email address be configurable on the server. So step zero really for us is go to our server, fetch that email address so that our app is not, you know, the email address is not burnt into the app. No, it doesn't go to everybody. So the idea here, you, this, this is a point-to-point -point notification system, me or I guess point, you know, one to many, but it's one to, to one at, at a time, right? So you can't actually send notification to everyone uh, from either end. When you, you, when you send your notification, you target a specific registration ID, which targets a specific application on a specific device. But what happens if one Yes, which is kind of like I said, you know, that's what we, how we built it. Like, so I'll show you, like you can, so the, the, the email, the registration, so you're asking for registration ID or registration email? Registration email for the application. Right. So like I said, you know, our, our app, the one, the one that I'll show you, doesn't actually have the registration email built into the app. What we do is we, the server, like our app does an HTTP GET on the server to get a registration email yeah. and then uses it to register for C2DM so that it's, you know, it's configurable. Well, you could have you could have multiple registrations with Google, and each app could have a different registration email tied to it if you wanted. Right. So, like, so if you wanted to, if if you're affected by effectively uh, the, the the quota limits. Exactly. That's what I'm afraid. Right. So you can sure you can certainly you can certainly do that. Okay. So you can register. I mean, you could potentially register for multiple email addresses, and you know, you you spread them across even the same inst installation of the app. I don't know how Google will look at that. They, so job. that is a good question, and this is somewhat something that they're somewhat unclear with as to how they enforce the limits. Are they able? You know, are you able to have multiple registrations on effectively the same package ID? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Right. We yeah. tried that. Or our company, they told us they, they recommended they us to do it. We had to use one account for all. Yeah, of and right. So I mean, you could potentially release it. Like if this is, you know, you could release your app multiple times or something. Like you yeah, could have a customer-specific app. So as long as your package name differs, you're good. But that's yeah. potentially an option. Okay. So again, this is the part that sucks, and this is the part. Unfortunately, as much as I would like to give you answers on. Yeah. It's really, it's a Google run service and they haven't been very upfront and clear with how to enforce these sorts of limitations. Sorry, okay, go ahead. So, so if the user uninstalls the app, you have all these stale messages. 
Right, so that's a good point, and thank you for mentioning that. So if your app gets uninstalled, the, un the, the, the app is automatically unregistered from this side, right? So C2DM knows to refuse future submissions from our server for that registration ID, and our server is supposed to basically, you know, get it gets an error code that says, hey, this registration ID is invalid, so at that point the server should deprovision the registration ID it has internally saved for that particular installation. And all right, right, right. Of course, of course, yes. Although generally, if you know, if we're on, you know, if we're online and we un un unregister our app, or maybe as we come online, we may get all these messages before we get a chance to unregister. Um, How secure is this whole process? So, good question. The connection between the messaging server and our app is SSL encrypted, and we'll see. Actually, Google has a pretty good way of keeping it SSL encrypted because that's actually quite expensive to do. Not for handshake reasons, because the connection gets reestablished so many times. Um, so this is SSL. Within, within the app, you know, yes, your message, your raw data is passing through Google servers, and it's passing within the app through Google infrastructure in the app, right? And you could argue, well, you know, could they not, you know, miss whatever? I mean, does that not that compromise the privacy or the integrity of my, my data? Now, generally, you could, nothing stopping you from encrypting the data on the server side, passing it as encrypted data, you know, in base 64 encoded message and then having your app decrypted so Google has no knowledge of it anyway. But you don't want to build your data in the message, mes message should not really contain sensitive info. The sensitive info should come at the last step. When we go and get notified, we go to our server and say, okay, give us the la last data. And we generally can do that over SSL. And that, and that point is outside of Google's hands anyways or anyone else's. Right, so it is. So the way you, you build your app effectively is up. To, it's up to you to guarantee that security, provide that security. Okay. So let's move on, and then we'll see if there are more questions later on. So, how does it all work? Right. So on the device, Google actually has a background service that's running at all times, and it's basically has this SSL encrypted connection. Okay. It honors the background data settings. So if the user says, "I don't want any background data," you know, basically maybe on a, they're on a, you know on a plan, one of those tiered plans, and they don't want to do it, you know, then it gets turned off and the push doesn't work. So that's one other limitation, but that's a, that's actually a good one. Um, it automatically discovers when network becomes available and unavailable, so it automatically starts and stops as needed. Um, it uses heartbeats to, to reconnect as necessary. So it'll actually, as you could imagine, run periodically. So that is polling, after all. Runs periodically, tests the, the, you know, the health of the connection. And some connections can be half open, so it, tries to, so it tries to basically push something to the server and get an act back. And if it fails, it reestablishes the connection. Now, in the cloud, so this is the service part of the C2DM, Google provides basically this farm, this massive farm of servers that they have already for their own stuff. Right, And basically, one of the features of their farm, in addition to being huge and allowing all these persistent connections, is that it has this smart SSL resumption system. So that basically, SSL, as you know, involves you know, public key encryption to establish the session key, which is then used through symmetric key encryption for the actual data passing. Right? But the, the, the public key encryption part and the, you know, the handshake until we get to the session key, it's quite a, kind of expensive, especially on a device where battery matters, right? Yes, they're getting more powerful, but, you know, batteries are not getting more powerful, at least not at the same rate as users demand them to be. So what we want is to cache the session key as, much, as long as possible so that when these connections are reestablished, we can effectively re reconnect. And so Google does that for us. Um, yeah, and, and what's also, you know, so basically uh, the server side can also detect that connection, so you can also push heartbeats from the server side. Uh, so the server side can actually say, oh, this died, so the next time around when there's a message to send to the, to the device, I'm not even going to try. Now, no, note that server cannot open a connection to the device, right? I mean, it's the device that has to connect to the server, not the other way around. Um, and so what we do, right, so our job, in addition, yes, there are a lot of steps, but our job really is to build a broadcast receiver that can accept these messages and then react to them, however we, you know, want to react to them. So, let's go through the steps. The first step is, you know, step zero, if you will, to go to this URL and sign up for an account, okay? They ask you for things like, you know, 
uh, the name of your app, you know, the package name of your app, it's okay if it hasn't been published yet. What, how many messages you expect to be sending, um, you know, in, to a, you know, an, an aggregate or, you know, uh, to a particular device at a time. Um, your contact information and, the most important, this role email. This role email is not meant to be a human email. It's kind of like you can call it, you know, for us it's like android at maracana.com. Whatever. It's very abstract. Okay? And this is the email that we're going to use to authenticate to Google. And this is the email we're going to use when we request the registration ID from C to DA. Okay? So, that part you need to do on your own. You just go to the web page, fill out the information, wait. Usually it takes a couple of days. You get, most of you will get it. Uh, unless you have some naughty things in your package name and you know it'll work what you then do is you need to set up your your app for c2dm this seems a little overwhelming uh, but it's not that complicated it's mostly boilerplate you only do it once so it's not a big deal the first thing you notice is that my app has this custom app here I call it my app I don't know how many of you know of this application object that exists in, uh, in Android, which is effectively a singleton in the way it works, not the way you actually code it, but the way it works in runtime, and allows you to share stuff through it. The reason why I have it is because that's one of the simple ways to share wake locks, and I'll explain later on why we use wake locks. So for the time being, that's not really c 2 dn specific, but it comes into play. Here's the big part, right? Here's basically our receiver. This is what we go and build. Now this receiver, notice, has this permission, this, you know, calm Google, Android, C2DM permission set. This basically, the reason why I put this permission here is so that we require that the sender of C2DM messages be this Google application, this Google service effectively. So that doesn't, someone else doesn't spoof the messages. You asked about security, well, this helps us, uh, you know, effectively weed out other applications from, you know, spoofing our notifications. What we then do is we register via intent filters for two actions. One is the receive, which is how we get notified of these messages. And then the other one is the registration. This is how we get called back when our registration ID is ready. This was step number one, right? So we go to Google internal service. We try to register. That somehow goes to the cloud and get, grabs us, assigns this registration ID. We now get it and we basically stick it, uh, we, we, we accept it via a broadcast receiver call, and it's for action registration. It's like an acknowledgement, basically? Sorry. Well, it's not just the acknowledgement. It actually contains, that's, so, so the way we get the registration ID is asynchronously, right? So it's a callback. Effectively, it's a callback. We request it, and at some point in the future, that particular event is going to fire, and we're going to get it, okay? You notice that there's categories here that are added uh, that effectively allow, uh, that just to weed out or to better yet, to, to, to avoid having our, the broadcast that we're getting go to other applications, okay? So that's why we have the category. Of course, there's actually a better, that's just, that's just to simplify or to make it a little more efficient so that other applications are not even considered should they try to receive our messages. Um, and they can have their own. Obviously, other applications will have their own broadcast receivers that will subscribe to exactly the same actions, but because they'll have different categories, they will only be interested in their own messages. That's how, that's how the broad, even though broadcast messages are, you know, one to many, in this particular case, they're one to one. One particular application is meant to get it. The application shouldn't be running. In fact, we don't want our application to be running for all intended purposes. This is, you know, that's the whole reason here. We, wanna, we don't want to break waste the battery, right? So that's, that's the whole point of broadcast receivers. So they will wake up this, this broadcast message that, 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 you know, that effectively we capture through this intent filter will start our entire, will launch, you know, a new Dalvik instance, will launch our application in it, will initialize a broadcast receiver, and will call the onReceive method on it. That's exactly how broadcast receivers are meant to work. So just to come back to one particular point here with respect to security, how do we ensure that effectively we only get this message? Okay, so one of the things we do is we declare a permission here. So notice this particular section, so right here, we declare a permission. Now that permission is our package name plus dot permission dot c2dm message. Okay, it's a predetermined permission name. Now the reason why we both declare it and use it, okay, so we need to use our own permission here, 
and it's basically a signature level permission. So the user will never actually see this. The, the user who go, gets to install your application, they will actually never see, oh, this application requires this particular permission because it's signature level. Okay? So what will happen is that Google C2DM infrastructure on the device, when it pushes the message to our application, the way will prevent others from effectively declaring their own receiver with exactly the same categories, i.e. they will be effectively be able to intercept their messages. So the way they prevent them is because we are the only ones who own this message. Right? So, sorry, this permission. So therefore, what they do, as I will show you in a moment, they basically push, create an intent, and when they send a broadcast, they add this permission. So this permission is predetermined. So that's so it's some kind of a, you know, you need to just provided in such, so it's always going to be package name plus permission, plus, you know, plus, you know, C2DM message. Uh, go ahead. Actually, my question is... Some, well, you want your apps to be, to be targeted separately. So your, each app is going to have a different package name, so therefore each app is going to have a different permission. And each app is going to have a different category, if there are two apps, right, if they have two different package names, which is how, how you differentiate two apps in the first place. Permission. You could. So you're right. In a sense, you could, you, you know, in that point, because you will pres presumably sign both apps with the same signature, so then you, will be, you, sh you could basically use it, and you could have both apps be, or, or basically an app that's not meant to be triggered, be triggered by this. But that's, I don't know why you would do that. I don't know what the use case is for that, but yes, it's possible. If my app triggers authentication. That would not be a use, good use case for authentication. I mean, it's, so it's possible how and why you would do it would be up to you. Sorry? Right, but again, you know, generally, just from what, again, let's take a look at the big picture. What's the idea here? We want to target a particular application. We don't, if that application gets the message and it wants to internally broadcast it to other applications, let it do in its own internal, internal broadcast. It wouldn't make sense to have all these applications be triggered and all these applications have to tie into the C2DM. That just, it's just bad design, right? You want to minimize your exposure to external interfaces, not, you know, make it bigger. Okay, so a um, couple of other things you notice here. I have a permission to receive, uh, so I have to require this permission to receive basically C2DM in the first place. This is just so I can participate in the C2DM framework. And just in this particular case, because I'll be obviously going to the internet to regis for registration purposes, I also need to grab an internet permission and I need to grab a wake lock. Okay? The wake locks are really only because I'm going to be doing long running operations. So in almost all cases, will you need these? Okay, and you'll see later on how, how you would use it. So, uh, good so far? Hoping. So this is basically, that's step number 1.1. 1.2 is where we actually, you know, kick off the registration process. Remember, we need to register. So what we do is we build an intent from, for example, a service or an application or a broadcast receiver application, doesn't really matter, one of our, you know, Android, you know, components, if you will, and in it we define this action, which is calm, you know, Google Android C to the M intent register. Okay, we then put an extra bit into this intent, and this extra seems like kind of cryptic. It's some pending intent of a broadcast that has just has an in internally an empty intent. Seems like what the heck is this? You don't even have to understand what pending intents are, nor what this would represent, and what those zeros actually mean. Because think of it this way. This pending intent is, think of it as just a signature of our app. Effectively, it includes our app's package name. That's it. Okay? This is how Google knows that we are the ones who requested this. It's just a requirement that we put it here. And then the last and most important thing, we need to put in here the sender. Right? This basically over here, this sender, this email address that you see over here is the email address that we basically use when we registered or in step zero when we sign up for C2DM. This is wanna... the email address? Right, that is the whitelisted email address. Okay? This you can make configurable as opposed to hard coding it, as, as I did in my in my app. And then we start our service. So we push the, this registration intent. We say start a service. This goes outside of our application scope, goes to Google. Google does the registration and sends us back the notification. Okay? So how do we get the notification? So this is the completing the registration. Okay? We build a broadcast receiver. Now, again, I hope you understand what broadcast receivers are. If you don't, think of it as components that can get, you know, triggered or tickled by, by anything on the system okay? through the use of intents. And this broadcast receiver has an on-receive method in which we grab, for example, the action. So we want to understand what was the action that was, in fact, that invoked a receiver. 
we test whether the action equals the registration part. Because the reason why we do this is because they tend to want to reuse the same receiver for both registration and to handle the receiver, uh, the, you know, the actual, you know, the messages. At that point, we can grab the registration ID. At that point, we have the registration ID, okay? Or we can have an error in, in case, for example, we have not, if this is a sender account that we used wasn't properly uh, uh, registered, or we may actually get this unregistered string, which just means that we unregister. It's kind of weird, like a re registration intent is also fired when you unregister, as we will talk about later. So we test for errors, we can test for whether or not we're unregistered, but let's assume we are registered. That's kind of what we're interested in. So we check for whether this is not null, and now that we know it's not null, we know we are registered on the server side, on the C2DM side. What we now need to do is take the registration ID and give it to our server so that our server can basically go and target our particular installation of the app. Okay? Now, generally, because talking to our server is a long-running operation, right? It involves I.O., involves network, which is slow, and we only have up to 10 seconds in the broadcast receiver before we get an ANR or the application not responsive, and you don't want to ever even approach the threshold of 10 seconds, you generally don't want to do anything like talking to a server inside of an on-receive method. We also cannot throw, you know, create a thread to do it, like or an async task, because as soon as the on-receive method is done, our broadcast receiver is considered dead, so our application can basically be disposed of. So you never want to create threads from broadcast receivers. So what we do is we create, we, we effectively have a service do the registration for us. Or when I say registration, I mean pass the registration ID to our server. So the way I do it, I create an intent, let's say I have something called reg service, and I go and basically stick this registration ID into the, you know, the, this intent as an extra, and then I start a service, okay? Now, so you're right, so my, my application actually, the way I built it is it actually has already a checkbox, and then you, you know, when the user presses in the checkbox, you know, that means, hey, you should be registered. And yes, you know, you may want to record the success or the failure of the registration. The way, I, the way I do it is if it fails to register, I just uncheck their checkbox. And maybe I give them like a little toast that says, hey, you just failed. Sure, it can be done better, okay? Um, so we now start a service, okay? Now, the service looks like this. Now, I'm going to assume you guys know what services are. Okay, and these are the background processes, and the reason why we like services is because they prevent our application from being disposed of. Uh, after all, all of this can run in the background. There may not be any UI, any activities associated with our application. It runs in the background, right? We don't want it to be killed. So services have higher priority than, like, say, background applications or stopped applications that just have activities, right? So the way I do it, though, is I build a, an in, or extend the intent service. The intent service has its own handle intent method, which is called by a separate thread. So intent service, for those of you that don't know, is effectively think of it as a, as a template for how to not have to deal with threading in a service, get it to basically to be done for you for free. So rather than you know, override the on start method or on start command, we override the on handle intent, which is internally invoked in a separate thread. Okay? That's what the intent service guarantees for us. And it has its own internal thread pools and all that stuff. So it you know, makes it super easy for us. So what we then do, grab the registration ID. If we wanted to, we can grab the user ID, assuming we have a concept of a user. Okay, or you can grab the device ID. The way you grab a device ID, you grab, you know, get a reference to this telephony manager um, through a system service, and then you ask the telephony manager for the device ID. For that to work, though, you need to add another permission, which is basically this, you know, uh, read phone state. So you need to stick that into your, you know, your your application or your manifest file. And at that point, we have the registration, and we have something that uniquely identifies that particular, you know, user or device. So we take those two pieces of information, and we post them, or however, send them to our server. Generally, using like URL connect or HTTP URL connection or HTTPS URL connection, which I hope you know how to do, or if you, or you can use the even better, the Apache uh, effectively commons HTTP client that's built into the Android uh, APIs or comes with Androids, you know, provided by the Android APIs. So that part is outside of the scope of this just because we can talk about that forever. It's generally well understood. You can just Google it and you'll see how to post, you know, in Java a simple HTTP, uh, make an HTTP post. 
Okay, and we, 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 what we're passing to our server is the device ID or the user ID plus the registration ID. Okay, now saving the registration. Now we're on the server. Okay, however you build the server, whether it's PHP or Java or whatever you prefer, um, we go and provide provide some kind of a storage mechanism for these registrations and the users. It's up to you how you build this. For example, you know, in my little sample application, I have a table called user say to the end in a MySQL database, which records two things, the user ID, which you know, is an, in an integer, I guess, um, and a registration ID, okay? which is the, the thing that I got from C2DM in step one. Okay? And I make my registration ID you know, be primary, or user ID be primary. Of course, the limitation of this is that I only allow a user to be registered on one device at a time. So if they have multiple Android devices, that kind of would you know, suck. So maybe I should actually use device ID as opposed to user ID. Whatever. Okay? And then what, you know, the way I do it is, I, you know, let's say this was a servlet, assuming you guys know servlets or at least have seen them or have a general understanding of how to read HTTP parameters. I would read basically the user ID and the registration ID or replace this with device ID. And then I would simply persist that into my database. Okay? So now I know that information. Should I want to target that user in the future? Uh, it can be bigger than 250. In fact, it's really big. Uh, it's uh, some, it's, um, I don't know, feels like maybe 500 characters. And I, since I don't know, it doesn't say how big it can be, I just don't want to think about it. Uh, <laughs> right, so the registration IDs, registration device IDs device are device specific. Right uh, now, if all I had here, <laughs> if I, if this is how I did in my server side, what would happen is that one device would register first, and then the second device would overwrite the previous device's registration, because presumably, you know, in this case, but I would just maybe call, refuse, as opposed to insert, replace this, you know, use the keyword insert, replace, and that will effectively overwrite it. But if I wanted to, I would just add a third column and call it device ID. And then I would make the user and the device ID be the primary key. So a combination of two would be the primary key. Go ahead. You don't, you, again, you don't have to use it. Oh, if you I'm wanted to target a specific device, I don't see way, you know, other ways around it. So yes, you can argue that there's you know, privacy issues per se, but not much you can do about it. There's no, no, no way around it. And if you know better, by all means, feel free to share. <laughs> it's, it's just an ID. I mean, it's, you know, if, if you want to encrypt it or whatever, if you're concerned, I mean, I'm not, I don't see, I guess if I, you know, all the applications in the world use the device ID, and yes, if one application leaks it, then you can infer things about the user in other applications somewhere else, and yes, that raises privacy issues. But again, that just, you know, we, we, we don't have, we can't, unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into, you know, how to best address this sort of thing. But you're right. I mean, it could be potentially something you may need to protect. Go ahead. Yeah. The app server on the device is then how would the push work? So the, the, the device would, you know, inform itself. Uh, there is already a, a built-in, you know, push mechanism in Android called broadcast receivers. I don't see how, you know, the whole idea is of the C2DM is for the cloud to tell us of something, not for something else on the device to tell us of something. Right? So if you do need something like that, you just use broadcast receivers, and that's, that, that's how that works. It's, it's what's, you know, built into Android. Okay? So, we save this. Again, how we save it is up to you. Go ahead. We need to, we need to unfortunately, move on. We, we only have another, I don't know how many times. How many? No, so hold on. The user ID here is your logical user ID. Let's say I was, uh, let's say, which is the, the app that I have is a Twitter-like client, okay? It's the Twitter user that would be the user ID. So, I would so basically, when I want to target a particular Twitter user to tell the Twitter user, hey, your friend has posted something, come grab it, that is so I would know that particular user's registration. So this is not in any way, shape, or form the, the Google account they used to sign up for C2DM in the first place. They're separate. So... Step number four, okay? We now go to C2DM, oh sorry, to client login to grab this auth token. Let me just, by the way, for one quick second, uh, let's see if we can go back to the slide, just, oh sorry, back, back to the big pictures, just so you kind of reconnect to where we are, right? So we did this, we did this, we recorded it, that was step three, now we're doing step four, okay? So in the step four, we go to this client login service. The client login service, basically, it's a simple HTTP request. Uh, it's a post 
to basically this URL, you know, www.google.com, you know, slash client login. And in the, in the post, we include these parameters. This, this, these are fixed, like this account type equals hosted or Google, just put it there, you know, take it for granted. Email equals, this is your role email. This is the email that you use when you sign up for C2DM. This is the email that was used when your account was basically being, uh, uh, up, you know, whatever, right? or when you, in, uh, in step one, did the registration, you added the sender thingy. The password is whatever password you provision with Google. The service part, this is important. We are now here saying we want to register specific or get an auto token that will specifically be used for AC to the end, Android cloud device messaging. And the source equals, it's kind of like a user agent string. You can put whatever the heck you want in there. And so what we then do, you know, we format it as an HTTP post, depending on how you do it. If you have a client that will do, you know, the, you know, whatever, put like a content length and content type headers for you, that's even better. And what we then get is some kind of response. We hope for a 200 response, and then, and then what we do is we parse that response for a effectively text, which is one line, which has auth equals something. And that something is the token that we care about, okay? This can fail or it can challenge us to do the CAPTCHA thing, which is basically to prove that we're not, you know, that we're human and this and that. But we generally, you know, hopefully we won't long have to do that because what we do is we cache, this is actually, should be bolded, we cache this, this auth token on the server side. Okay, so for future messages, we use it. We don't have to go back and re-authenticate. This is like a, almost a one-time thing. Periodically, you know, it may force us to come back and then we just re-authenticate, re but it's not that big of a deal. So now that we have it, now it's the juicy part, right? All of this was just a setup. Now we want to effectively send messages. This is basically why we're doing this in the first place. The way we do this is we basically create another HTTP post, again, from our app server. And that post, it goes to that URL that you see there, okay, some predetermined URL. And that post expects the following parameters, okay? The parameters are the registration ID. Well, our server knows it because it knows the user. So, by the way, at this point, our server is trying to target a particular application. So, it should know the registration ID, okay? The collapse key will explain a little later. It's a required parameter. I'll explain later on when and how it gets used. Okay? Then we can provide a whole bunch of data dot, you know, name equals value parameters. These name equals value become the extras in the intent that you receive on the on the on the on the you know on your app side. Okay? These are arbitrary. You don't have to put anything in here if you don't want to. But these are arbitrary, just name equals values. The only limitation is that the, you know, the combined size of the message must not exceed uh, 1024 bytes. And then there's another op uh, uh, optional parameter called delay while idle, and I'll explain later on, you'll see how and get the, 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 that gets used. The only other required uh, bit is to basically pass in this authorization header. And the authorization header is Google all login space auth equals and then your auth token. This is the thing that we've got in this previous step number five. Okay, that's it. We now submit that request. We, if we get a, resp a 200 response that has ID equals some number, which is not even important because then we can't really correlate, correlate that ID to anything, but we get some kind of response back that's not an error response, we're golden. Okay, so there's no, as long as there's no error, uh, you know, error in, in the 200 response, that means our message was sent out. Okay? At that point, there's not much we can do. Now, if you don't mind, save your questions until the end just because I know some people have to leave and I want to go through the slides first. So, um, now our message is in the C2DM front end. It was accepted by C2DM front end. Now, what it, what it then does, so we can handle errors and there's all sorts of errors we can get, like quote exceeded, device, you know, quote exceeded. This could be like, Quote exceeded basically, you know, too many you know, messages sent in aggregate or too many messages sent to a particular device um, or invalid registration ID or expired registration. Maybe our app was uninstalled or the user specifically asked to, un to uninstall it or message too big or missing collapse key in case we forgot to include it. And I'll explain what collapse key is. We may also get a 401, which, is, which would mean that a client login expired or is, was invalid, right? At this point, you know, uh, that you should go and re-authenticate re with client login, okay? So you repeat step number five. And that's it. 
If the server is busy, you may get a 503, which will include like a retry after header, which means, hey, don't come back until that time. If you do, you know, Google may, you know, whatever, ban you or somehow other punish you by decreasing your quota or impose a stricter limits, okay? So you should honor that header. My particular code doesn't, for sample code doesn't, but whatever, you should. <laughs> um, now, step six, seven, and eight, let me just reconnect to what step six, seven, and eight are so you can see it, are basically we do the authentication, you know, of the token, we queue the message, we route to deliver for delivery. Okay, those are the steps six, seven, and eight. These are happening in the cloud. So let me just quickly show you uh, what those look like. So it goes and verifies our, auth our token. Okay, that seems logical. It then temporarily queues our message to some kind of a durable store, whatever that is. Okay, think of it as a message queue. And so these messages are held here until they're either delivered or they expire. The expiration is not something we get to control. So there's no support for TTL, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, and it's you know helps with the best efforts. You'll automatically retry as necessary. If there was now we can kind of come back to the collapse key. If there is already a message that's previously been queued, which has exactly the same registration ID and the collapse key, that message will be replaced. So the idea behind the collapse key is let's say your user goes on a, on a plane, so they put their phone in the in the airplane mode. And, or they come here and they have no signal, right? And now they all of a sudden come into the zone where they have signal. If you've previously sent them a whole bunch of notifications that their friends, you know, posted some messages to on their profile or something, like if it was a Facebook application, it doesn't make sense for their application to be tickled, you know, 50 times if there were 50 posts. You only need one tickle, right, one notification, because you just want the, you, the application to go back to your server and fetch all the data. Right? So by having the same collapse key in your messages, you ensure that you effectively replace previous, you know, not, not cached or queued, you know, notifications for that particular user. Okay? Um, uh, and then finally, so uh, what we then do is uh, we route the message to the messaging server, which hopefully holds the connection to a device if it's open. If it doesn't, obviously, if it's not open, then, you know, the, the message just stays in the queue, and at some future point, you'll, you know, recheck again. So, step nine. So let's quickly go through this. So in step nine, we basically go and, uh, you know, we want to now deliver the message. So now, well, the way it works is that we basically first check for whether we should delay the delivery of the message, okay? This is, by the way, the messaging service wanting to deliver the message to our device. So it goes and says, should we wait? Now, why would we wait? Well, there's basically something called attenuation, which Google automatically implements, and you, it's not optional. You cannot disable it. And what it is, it effectively prevents <coughs> our device from getting this constant stream of messages. What it will do, it will detect if there's a high frequency of messages target, being targeted to a particular, particular app and collapse key, so registration and collapse key. And if there is, there, these messages may automatically be queued or delayed, which will then hopefully, if you use the same collapse key, prevent you know all these messages from being you know streamed to the device you know in a, at some you know very high rate. The idea behind this is that we temporarily delay it. How temporarily? You know, it's on order of seconds, potentially minutes. Okay. The and, and we, you know the, the the goal is that we prevent spinning up the radio for the delivery of the message for every single message, which ultimate goal is protects the battery and if in, in case our messages are constantly notifying the user, you know, we potentially are less annoying to our users. Um, so the first few messages are let through and then, you know, if the, con the stream continues at the same rate, Google may, and this is not well documented as to when and how they decide to do this, so don't ask me questions unfortunately about that, I can't answer because I don't know. Um, they may basically go and say, hey, you know, we, this may have to wait a little. And this happens in the cloud on the Google side. You may have to wait. Yeah. Oh, it's per, per app collapse piece? Per yes, it's per, app per, per, per app, which is basically per registration on a particular device. Okay, because I thought app like the, all the devices for one. App no, app sorry, app it's for, for particular, device. yes. So okay. it is per, so I should actually change this. So thanks okay. for pointing that out. Okay? okay. The other little feature, this is controllable by us is something called delay while idle. If you remember, that was one of the parameters we could have specified here. We just say equals true or equals something. And what happens if we do include it is that basically we wait until the device becomes active, 
before we actually send the message. Now, how the heck do we know if the device is active? The device, because it has this constant connection with Google at all times, it automatically tells the connection server when its screen is on. If the screen is off, maybe you don't care about these messages. Maybe it doesn't make sense to inform the user. Who cares? Right? So that's basically, if we do include it, so there's certain classes of applications where we don't care to inform the user if the device is off anyways. And it's really just on the, the screen being off or on, not whether the CPU is off or on. And here's finally the message delivery. So this is, the message now gets sent over the TCP connection that's uh, still encrypted to our device. Something on their device gets the message, okay? Some kind of a service, which is actually this thing, well, actually it's not necessarily this thing. This thing goes and pushes the message. I just basically scanned for what sends the broadcast message, and this is basically some Google built-in thing, okay? And so what it does, and this code is just kind of, it's, you know, uh, it's not real code. I mean, I invented this. I kind of just based on what I expected them to do. I haven't actually, I don't have access to their source code. But what they do is they build this receive intent. In the intent, they add category that targets our particular application. And then they put all of our data. So if we had like data.foo equals bar, that becomes foo equals bar as an extra field. Okay? And so all of our data gets put in here. And then they go and send the broadcast, which is with our intent. But in the broadcast, they create a special permission, which is our app plus permission plus C2DM message. This is how they ensure that only our app gets the message. Otherwise, other apps may intercept your messages and they can do whatever they want with them. Okay? So if you remember, you know, well, again, my slides are available online, so you can see, go back to the Android manifest XML to see kind of what this looks like. Okay? So this is how we tar target our particular receiver. Um, uh, receiver. Now, how do we receive the message? This is, we're almost done, okay? We basically, the first thing is we're going to need to go back to our server when we receive the message. The problem is, while our device will be woken up, okay, if, when this message comes in, the message will only, well, or device will be available to us as long as we are in the on receive method of the broadcast receiver. After the on receive method is done, our device may very well go to sleep, in which case us going and fetching the data from the server will not happen. So what we need is to grab a wake lock. If you don't know what like wake locks are, you know, read them, go, you know, to Power Manager and you'll understand them. It's fair, it's, they're not that complicated. So what we do is we basically, I yeah, created something called a custom application class that basically creates an instance of a, and of course I, it seems that I didn't actually declare the wake lock, uh, so this is missing actually the declaration. But there's basically some kind of a, you know, wake lock which we go and fetch from this power manager and we provide methods here for acquire and release. And this also checks for if the, if the wake lock is already held, it just returns false as opposed to try to reacquire it, which you know, wouldn't work anyways. Okay? So you'll see in a moment how we use this. So here's basically us processing the message. Here's the broadcast receiver that actually gets triggered by C2DM. This is the final part, right? We get the on receive method gets invoked. We check for whether the action is you know, receive action. That's the one that we're now interested in. We can now go and fetch all of our, you know, extras, like our, you know, foo one, foo two, whatever we need to fetch, if they mean something to us. If there are no extras, who cares? Now what we do is we grab a reference to our app object, which we have implicit reference to, which is the way Android works, okay? And through the app object, we try to acquire the wake lock. If the wake lock doesn't, if we can't get it, it means that we're already running this code, so we don't want to do it again. Okay? So only if this works, we actually go and acquire the wake lock. We then build an intent, which basically in, uh, runs our service, which will then refresh the data. Remember, we cannot go back to our server to fetch the most up-to-date data in the on-receive method because it's an expensive operation. And then you cannot do that from the broadcast receiver. So again, we go back to our service, maybe we pass some, some kind of a, you know, information to our service, if that's of relevance to our service. Most likely it wouldn't be, but let's say there is. And now, the final part is we basically, in our service, if we needed to, we grab our full one, if that means something to us, we go to our server, back to our server, via an HTTP GET or, or whatever, however you want to go to your server, right? 
So simple HTTP request, and you get your data, and maybe you store it to a local database in SQLite database or something like that. And then finally, you release the wake log. And at that point, the device may go to sleep. Of course, you could in here do notifications, you can put toasts, you could launch activities, not that you should, but you, know, you could do all sorts of things inside of that on-handle request. And again, this is one of those intent services. Okay? So, I know we're all one minute over, but let's wrap it up. So, the final part is acknowledging the delivery. This happens automatically. As soon as the message is acknowledged by the device, it goes back to Google. Google says, oh, we got it. It removes it from the, from the, from the uh, message queue. Now, you know, that's it. So, here it says, you know, it's easy as 0 to 10. Seems not that easy. But in reality, all of this is boilerplate. You do this once. Right? And yes, it involves a little bit of setup, but it's not that complicated, right? I mean, actually, there's more complexity on the server side than on the client side. So it's fairly easy to follow, okay? Um, if you want to go back to sending more messages, you already have the registration ID, you already have the auth token, you just repeat steps, you know, five, five, and effectively Google does everything else. So it's super easy. You may have to worry about, you know, if this fails with a 401, you may need to re-authenticate. If this fails with quota exceeded or 503, you may need to back off. So then potentially, and this is the hard part, potentially you on the server side may need to build a message queue, right? In case your, you know, your, your messages aren't being accepted by the, by, by the Google servers. And so that you can, you can do your own, you know, retries. Um, and if you want to unregister, should you need to, you basically unregister through an intent. That also goes back to your receiver. The same thing fires. You now just get unregister and you unregister. You go back to your server and unregister should you need to. Um, so in summary, you know, we want to keep the data fresh. Polling sucks. Don't use it. We want to use push. SMS is okay but expensive. We, don't, we could roll our own persistent connection, but that's hard and, you know, and expensive. Um, C2DM is free. Um, we already leverage what's already there, right? We can amortize this one existing connection that Google already has across a range of these apps. So, you know, it's much better battery experience or battery life and therefore user experience on the devices. Um, and, you know, we get these advanced features like uh, uh, automation, you know, delay while idle, collapse keys and so on and so on. The only problem is still in labs, not quite clear on what the terms are. So, thank you. For, uh, for listening. Hopefully you learned something. Um, I'll stay around in case you guys have any questions. I know some of you want to leave. If you want to get these slides as, as, well, as well as the sample code that includes a complete app, which I'll explain more. I need to actually update this, this uh, documentation. So complete app, it includes a server-side component, everything, and it works. You can test it out. Go to that URL for other videos and stuff on Android check out our uh, tech TV. So thank you guys. Thank you.